What the hell is up, ladies and gentlemen? Today, we're gonna be going back in time to the 6th of May, in the midst of Acropolis Number no. 1's balance patch back in the throne room days. And this one is indeed on Axiom, a two-spawn map by Biddy B. You may have seen Maxium games recently. Well, this is the two-spawn version of that map that came before the four-spawn version. And it will have Aud64 taking on Hupsea, one of our higher-skilled Protoss players. Let's see how this match went. We have Hupsea in the top right. We have Aud in the bottom left. I am very interested in seeing how this game is gonna go because if you guys don't know, shout out to Monsieur Crankendow all the way from Lithuania who's been helping me out by basically going through and previewing a bunch of games and saying like, basically ranking them and saying like, hey, these are good for cast, these are good for cast. Well, this one scored fairly high. And it also is apparently a fairly uh, lengthy title, just based on the fact that, you know, I have this ability to see the file size of the replay. And this one's over 300 kilobytes. And that might not sound like a lot to all you Zoomers who play Call of Duty and it takes 300 gigabytes to install one fucking skin. But I swear to God, that's actually a pretty big file for a replay. So. Uh, absolutely, I expect we're going to be settling in for a banger here. And so while we wait for the action to get underway, I highly recommend dropping a subscription onto this channel. We've got daily videos coming every damn day. Uh, we are now about uh, 90 daily casts, I'm pretty sure, or we're very close to it if we're not already past that. I can't remember. I think actually this is the 91st. So within the next two weeks, we will cross that Rubicon into three digits numbers of days per uh, video and stuff. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. I'm happy about that. And uh, you know, gotta respect the grind, right? So if, if the grind has earned nothing, it's earned your subscription, drop it, and we'll see you around here. Now, uh, as we get closer to 3000 subscribers, because we're actually seeing growth on the channel for a while, uh, for the first, first time in a while, I should mention that I'll be doing something kind of special around that time. Uh, I have some ideas, but nothing is set in stone yet. So if you have any suggestions for that, Drop them in the comments. Ayud is going to go ahead and scout his opponent. His gateway is all the way off to the side, which is kind of cute. I don't know if that's significant. See the old Hierophant graphic here. Uh, indeed, uh, sort of landmarking this game and saying, hey, yeah, this is a game that is a little bit on the older side. And somehow that scribe slips the net. The Vulture not able to find it. Quarry coming in the background. Yeah, this is definitely you know, early May PVT sort of uh, legwork here. I love uh, hiding the Mason for a rescout later. The Hierophant may not find it. Obviously a very fast unit, but uh, is he is Hapsaya going to know that that's where everything's at? Vulture's narrowly missing out on killing the Scribe. You know, you think about it, it's like down to the these early details. You know, d does everybody actually get out with their scout worker? Well, the Terran w is able to move ahead with the worker count using its second production queue thanks to that quarry. So that obviously makes a big difference. All right, an embassy in the back. So it's a one-gate embassy build. Okay, I don't know what Hapsaya is thinking, but I guess the, the Hierophants early on are going to stop any Vulture push, and he's going to use the embassy to power up early on workers so that he can match the worker count of the Terran, which is not something that the Protoss are normally able to do. So I like this build from him on that front. It's so funny sort of applying the current PVT sensibilities of like, yeah, of course, and you tank drop here, and you do this, and you do that, and, uh, you know, you, you, you go Masquerade into Arden or whatever. Like, there's all these things that we do now that, uh, you know, you might not do back in the day when this game was played. So it's, it's very interesting to kind of look back and see how fast the meta has evolved and changed, uh, not just due to balance patches, but also due to what people have discovered. And so, indeed, speaking of discovery, the Embassy will be making a witness first that's going to allow Hapsaya to get a good scout going. And this Mason is just here to move back uh, and forth a little bit to see wh what the timing of the Nexus is. So at some point, Aud will indeed figure that out. He's laying more lobotomy mines around the map. Lobotomy mines stun units and then slow them as opposed to dealing damage. So they're a little bit different. Hapsaya's witness will be able to spot a couple of them. And what is he doing next? He's actually idling his uh, worker over there. Okay, he's going to go for a second gateway. So nothing too... Stupendous just yet. The Mason actually slipping the net somehow, making his way out. I can't believe this man. Secret agent has uh, gone all the way back out. That's really epic. And the mines are even going to cover his exit, dude. What a, what a legend, honestly. 
Well, let's see if he if he hangs around a little bit too long, he might not be able to escape. But I still like it. Now he he did see the uh, the Nexus timing. Units just kind of hanging out by the choke. Upsaya wants to wait for his witness to arrive in the enemy base to scout the second fulcrum. He, when you detect a building, you can actually click on it and see what it's building and what the progress bar is, which is really cool. See what's in the queue. All that stuff. So I think that's an underrated aspect of Cosmonarchy, but that's just me as, you know, the lead designer. I have no bias, of course, except towards Cosmonarchy because it's epic. Now, I am very interested in seeing what the... Uh, what the follow-up is going to be out of AOD he is going to go ahead and preemptively transfer some units down to his natural. His natural comes up at the same time as Hepsea's. And the worker count is obviously in favor of Aud, but with a uh, third worker production queue, thanks to this Nexus, he'll actually be able to stretch ahead. Now, Aud doesn't want that for very long. He's going straight into a quarry, so he can sort of offset that. Uh, but we should still see something like... I want to say maybe like a two worker advantage max for Aud. It really depends on how uh, on the ball everybody is. Starpad being built back at home. That's going to be for Anseals to help detect these pesky witnesses, but also to help protect the ground game versus the uh, burst damage that the gateway army provides. Although it's not really a mass Drakadin type of game right now, is it? He's adding Ecclesiasts and Zealots. I'm saying making sure to get that heavy army like it is. We will probably end up seeing the old Obtecton again, if I had to suspect. You know, if I had to just blindly speculate as to what uh, what uh, Hapsaya is going to go for. So, if we look at the map, the vision that is present here for uh, for Aude, I do think that he's, he's obviously doing better in some ways than his opponent. His opponent does have the witness in the main, in the natural now. So, Hapsaya definitely knows more about it, what his opponent is doing. Whereas Aud definitely knows more about w the state of the map. Now, when you scout the army back at home, Hapsaya doesn't really worry too much about the whole idea that, like, hey, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not really worried about your army because I see that your army is out here. So, you know, at, at worst, you might have like a couple of units scattered around the map, or and indeed, as we see this uh, secret agent that's just hanging out there after his successful info gathering mission, he has one last target. And indeed, you can see here that the witness was destroyed. This one just here spotting for drops, which is not a bad shout. We've got a pylon over here marking where the third is likely to be placed. And the fact that Upsaya is thinking about his third nice and early is a pretty good sign. Now, Aud is not going to try to even bother rescuing Secret Agent Butts. He's just dead, dude. Unfortunately, he has not been able to... Uh, Oh, he stands and fights. He stands on and fights at the last moment, at least. He, he's restored his honor after running that far. Couldn't couldn't slip the net one last time. So sad. Now, it will be a Cyclops drop, and it is going to go at, towards the natural. So this could actually be a pretty uh, impactful moment. Mine's just providing a limited amount of coverage. No witness here to reveal the ex remaining mines. We'll see if uh, Upsay actually remembers. I'm pretty sure the Shaman is deployed directly on top of one, so that could be a bit awkward. Some preemptive transfers happening as 12 o'clock is erected. Double Ardent Authority in the natural. Feels like maybe that could have even gone down a bit earlier if you're if you're able to put two of them down at once, you know. Uh, but uh, you know what? That's okay. What matters is that you get them down eventually and uh, that you're able to, to build the every, what the Terran fears, right? The Architect. Very powerful long-range unit. Now here comes the Cyclops drop. It is indeed in action here. And I'm not sure how many workers have actually gone down. You gotta watch out about stacking them up here. Oh no! That's a hit the stop key and let them split if I've ever seen one. But Hapsaya still ahead in workers. Macro rotations working out better for him. And I think the Trojan will have spotted this base when it flew over. So, you know, at the end of the day, that harassment, it doesn't really accomplish that much just yet. And Hapsaya does now have the macro advantage. You know, it's good initial management for sure. Now, Aud is going to see if he can pop out of here. He's got the Harakans for the, you know, sort of burning down the, the Zealots. Uh, when the Harakan attacks, it rends armor because it has that very powerful passive called Apollyoid Adhesive, which is actually like a cornerstone of what the Terrans are all about. Now, it looks like Hapsaya fancies an attack from multiple fronts, which is pretty cool. Treasury going to go ahead and make landfall at the third. You can see the, the selection of thirds is different here. 
Eud taking what is conventionally the third, whereas Sepsea has gone for 12 o'clock, and he's actually going to spread across the top part of the map. We just saw him set up a camera hockey and a scribe over in the top left. So while we wait to see how this battle is going to turn out, it's just worth remembering that Hepsea is indeed putting down that nexus. So let's see how this one goes. Most of the Harakans end up getting obliterated by those zealots, but the friendly fire, the splash damage, it's enough to, to bring down a little bit of the Harakan count. It's also enough to soften up those zealots massively so that the rest of the army can swoop on in and deal with it. So that ends up being pretty effective in favor of Eud, and now Hepsea has to fall on back a little bit. He does have some architects. He's making some acantors now. Uh, the acantors are good versus the uh, front line, basically, because they deal that splash damage, and you kind of like walk into them anyway in order to attack the rest of the army. We do see another Trojan being made. I'm curious as to what that'll be all about. Did he end up losing? He's lost track of his other Trojan off to, off to the side there. And now it looks like Ayud is trying to think about sharking forward. If you can call this sharking, he's. it's like he stabs forward and then unfurls and, and waits for a moment and then, you know, let's see where we go from there. Uh, Architect's now dealing a little bit of damage on the way out. Basically, the way the Architect works is that when it uh, travels us enough of a distance, uh, it will be able to split as long as enemies are nearby. Uh, so that's why you're seeing the one missile become two and stuff like that. Uh, and so when it splits, it just deals the same amount of damage, which is pretty high, as you can see. It's 40 uh, to all of the targets nearby. Uh, it's up to two additional targets, actually. So you're talking about a unit that can deal from 40 to up to 120 damage, depending on you know how many targets are nearby and how long it goes. Uh, there was a, a proposed revision by Veek, actually, my homie, uh, who said uh, something to the effect of it should gain a missile split based on like uh, if it travels four range, and then so if it travels eight range, it has two. And so it's not like as because uh, right now it, if it doesn't travel enough range, it just doesn't split at all. And so that might be a way to make it so that it's a little bit more powerful uh, at the mid range times. Now let's talk about that a little bit later because the zealots are already descending upon this middle ground here. And the front line is sort of holding for Hepsea, but now the phalanxes are deployed, right? And so all of those sacrifices, all those Harakans, all those vultures, yeah, of course they end up giving uh, the game, giving up the ghost. Uh, but the, the main thing that you gotta watch out for here is, you know, those phalanxes. What are they doing to, uh, in, you know, encourage the rest of these forces to come through? Yeah, exactly. You really cannot face it off against them. And it's, you know, it's kind of lucky that uh, they have the mortar instead of uh, anything else. So, you know what? That works out. Now, that zealot attack did end up getting routed thanks to the phalanxes. we got some clerics here as well. Uh, they're trying to keep the mech units patched up with their nano guns. Very epic. Now, the architects are still trying to lay siege. They haven't actually been able to finish off all of the units. You'll notice that the ant seal is protecting from some of that damage with its bubble. Help, helping to mitigate a little bit. But there's only one ant seal, right? It's not like there's a lot of them. So uh, that's something that's a little bit concerning. Unfortunately, oh man, speaking of concerning, you really got to watch out for those kinds of attacks. Y you need the phalanxes to target something other than the architects. Because otherwise they're just going to explode. Uh, so the Zealots are coming on down to maybe offer that. There's a lot of Zealots, in fact. Uh, I love the mass gate style that we've got coming over here. And now an Ancestral Archives for good measure. So that's very cool. I'd love to see a Crucible in that neck of the woods just start pumping out those units even faster. And uh, yeah, I'd say a look in, in uh, powerful positions here. Let's see what his Architects can do as the Zealots are trying to soak up all that damage. The Shaman in the front line doesn't last very long. That was providing a lot of healing in the area, but... Uh, there's not much of a front line to heal anymore because they've all uh, ended up falling. The Acantor are doing plenty of work on the splash. And you know what? I feel like this Architect stack is moments away from actually being able to deal some crippling damage to these Phalanxes, especially since Ayud is busy trying to deal with the front line at the same time. Well, there we go. Finally, two Architects going down. And there's so many Phalanxes that it is quite difficult to attack into. He needs to wait for another Gateway Rally or two. More of them coming on down. Dude, tell me this isn't exactly what you would hope for out of StarCraft 1. I mean, Mass Gate, dude, that's exactly it. But isn't it, isn't it so epic when there are 50 units per race and so there's way more that you can make than just Zealots? I mean, Zealots are, are certainly working out right now. Uh, I, I would say that maybe some Ecclesiasts could work too, but the problem is the Phalanxes can just splash them all to hell. Now, it looks like Ayud is just going to go ahead and try to secure this 9 o'clock position for his fourth base. He's also set up a treasury, <laughs> funnily enough, at 10 o'clock, uh, but 11 has already been taken for a, uh, for a while now by Hapsea. He hasn't fully saturated it yet. He has kind of uh, meandered a little bit on 
the worker count. He's actually sub 100. Um, he's also meandered a little bit on the expansion count, right? He took that uh, ele that 11 o'clock position a long time ago now. Uh, and it, it's uh, it's not really been evolved since then, right? He hasn't taken his, his normal third. We do have a double drop coming in here. Harakans, Goliaths. Let's see if they can maybe snipe out this Crucible or some of the, the pylons and such. Uh, what exactly is that going to look like? Hapsaya now trying to attack into this fortified position. As this drop is happening, they are going to go after the Embassy and the Workers. And so that is a little bit scary. I think if you drop the main at this time, you usually go after tech. But you know what? Going after the Workers isn't the worst thing in the world. And if you deny the Embassy, then okay, if they ever want detection later, they're going to have to deal with that as well. So let's see what the response is. For now, Hapsaya is just fully focused on trying to split the area over here and deal with that attack now that he's sort of isolated. Okay, I know that my opponent is busy with that stuff. And sort of like a, hey, I've killed all of these workers. Time to move on. Uh, the Archon doing some damage. The uh, Acantors are going to be able to clean this up nice and easy. Some Zealots have been pulled on in. I don't know if that was a deliberate attack or not. Wasn't paying attention. But it looks like it was deliberate because they're going out right after the Masons. So good counter damage here from Hapsaya. Uh, the attempted unload. Uh, he can still come over here. There's still enough over here to deal some good uh, worker damage, especially with all those Harakans. So that Warden will not be living for very long. The workers are starting to plummet. You can see the, the worker count going absolutely kaput. And Hapsaya, he's losing his units in the front as well. Uh, the drop's definitely th sending him through a loop. Oh, no, the combat drops of Ahmed's charging forward, burning down the architects. Oh, one of them goes down, the other one not very far away. Finally, this drop has been cleaned up, but both of the Trojans surviving is actually a pretty big victory. Speaking of big victories, having that Architect still alive at this stage is pretty surprising as well. Double Archon. We've got enough Tecton queued up afterwards. The Harakans do not claim victory over the remaining stragglers, and uh, clerics are here trying to heal up all of those uh, phalanxes. As you see, a bunch of sentinels were made over here. Whenever you see a bunch of sentinels in an area, I'm always personally tipped. <laughs> what the hell happened over here? The lift and then the nexus underneath it. Okay, makes sense. Need to see way more workers, man. Uh, lost all of the ones in the main, lost a bunch of them in the third, lost some in the natural. We'll see what uh, Hapsaya can do to get back into things. His money's definitely fallen a little bit. See the pylons, see the eventual static defense, but Ayud wants to shut this one down nice and early. He wants to be able to land that treasury. He has designs on this place, but his units just found the military moving through the rest of the map. So now he's falling on back. He's going to allow the Protoss to just build around this. Man, you know it's been an action-packed game when that happens. All right. Architects, Acantors, Archons, Triple A, dude. Let's see what this Triple A composition can do for Hepsea. He's trying to deal with everything else. The one Archon charging forward with a couple of Zealots. Friendly Fire definitely helping actually thin the herd of the front line a little bit. But losing an Archon is a little painful. And now two Madcaps have come up to start shooting that, uh, that Nexus while a Warden comes in. And that will be targeted down as well. So what's going to be the reaction here? If you just throw Zealots at these Sentinels when the Phalanxes are nearby, that's absolutely going to be good enough to deal some damage there. He kills one of the Sentinels, so he can move through in this area a little bit easier. And he will be moving forward to try to deal with the Madcaps. And as that army moves up, he, you know, Ayud knows the jig is up. He's going to go ahead and pull the treasury back. And uh, that is going to be it. This base will indeed be Hapsaya's. It looks like that embassy never got finished off. So we, instead, we're going to have some re pylons to repower the lost structures. Actually, uh, even re repowering some gateways. And now, during all of this excitement, we neglected to talk about the fact that Tier 2 was achieved. But Tier 3 is on the way. Guys, the Terran is heading to Tier 3. Spooky things are happening. Unfortunately, Double Acantor just died. That is expensive and very painful for the war effort in particular. So, okay. We're going to need to fall back from this position from uh, Hapsaya's POV. He's set up a fifth base. He is going to be up in bases, but he's only now uh, achieving some kind of worker parity for... It feels like a uh, first time in a, a little bit here. Double up Tecton. They can definitely help out. We'll see what the uh, reaction is from Ayud, who is doing his best to uh, rock the sort of combined arms, mechanized regiment sort of style here with the mad Madcaps, the Harakans, and of course, a whole bunch of clerics and mech units. Even though some vultures still at this stage in the game. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Goliaths and phalanxes. Oh my. Now, a counterattack coming in with the Zealots. Uh, I do think that without any additional help over here, that Sentinels will indeed be overrun by the Zealots, so that's a little bit scary. Now, at this point, the Optectons have been revealed, 
So Aud is aware that that's going on, but he has plenty of phalanxes for the time being to lay siege to this position. And the attack come wrapping around from the right-hand side is going to be absolutely enormous. But so too are these Acantors, just absolutely shredding the front line. The Zealots are now being routed and attacked by reinforcements, so Aud will be able to hold on to that base without losing too many of his workers. He has lost all of his... Uh, his Sentinels, unfortunately. And now the Phalanxes are coming to try to push those Uptectons back while the main force is attacked. Phalanx is deploying, getting a lot of shots cracked up, but they need to focus their fire onto these Acantors and Uptectons. Otherwise, they are going to slowly be pushed forward and instead, Aud will pull them back. He's got an Iron Foundry and a Nanite Assembly being assembled behind this. If he can make a push to shut down 12 o'clock, that can definitely be a pretty good move. Unfortunately for Hepsei, I think he's taken the foot off the gas just a little bit too long here, and now the Architect is down, one of the Patriarchs died. Uh, definitely a, a couple of losses here that he didn't really want to be making. Somehow these Zealots are still alive and have indeed rendered down that uh, that worker count. It's very, very low compared to what it was before. Uh, lost something like 30 workers there, uh, so that is no bueno, but so too is losing an attack on. So there are definitely some losses on both sides. We do have the space slowly becoming saturated, but Hepsea has the worker count advantage very in large part due to his zealot run by. I can't believe that that was so effective that whole time. But the problem is he doesn't have any production structures elsewhere. He only has them in his main and his natural is currently being choked out. So how is he going to get zealots around to run by again? Well, the answer is he's not. Not right now, anyway. One up tech on dropping fairly low on the shields, but it'll regenerate pretty fast. Yeah, interesting. Okay, this uh, tank stack is going to go ahead and withdraw. Six o'clock now taken, so we are going to be up to five bases once again. Just looking around here, we have the future station starting, so that's probably for Penumbras. And, of course, the Magnetar is on the way. Everybody's big, biggest uh, fan of the Magnetar. All right, so the battle lines have been reset once again, and the worker count is, again, in favor of Hepsea. Although, Aud is still re-establishing this position. He hasn't actually lost the treasury. At that point, the Zealots definitely could have right-clicked the treasury. <laughs> but there was another one waiting in the wings to land, so it wouldn't have been the end of the world. Hapsaya getting brave, moving on to his opponent's side of the map. Looks like something was built here by mistake, probably a Biotic Bastion. And so it was cancelled. And now a Penumbra is out, a Magnetar is out. What's the reaction from Hapsaya? Hapsaya is going to go for the analogs. But I'm wondering if he's not considering any additional tech. He's got a little bit of gas in the bank. He could be going up for some more stuff. All right, here comes an attempt at attacking down for the, uh, yeah, this whole sequence over here. The Magnetar is out. It's going to go ahead and channel Yamato. That will get rid of one of the Optectons. Okay, very interesting choice. He's pulling the Positrons forward. Does have to watch out for a counterattack because the Magnetar itself is not very... Um, tanky, shall we say. But there's also not really that great uh, anti-air over here, right? So that's a concern. Another Yamato charged, and that just napes down the Patriarch count almost immediately. Gotta watch out for that unit, and the fact that there wasn't really any anti-air over here definitely spelling a bit of doom. But the Zealot run by shuts down the bottom right base, is going to continue harassing 6 o'clock as well. So all of a sudden, even though Aud held over here, and he even did a, a good amount of damage to the high-tech power units that Hapsaya was fielding, I mean, is that going to be enough? Prostration stage, probably for a Mind Tyrant. That will definitely allow the... Uh... Oh no, the Penumbra has been dealing splash damage to the Masons that whole time. That was That's horrifying. That's like the worst thing you you uh, can see as a, as a Terran player, I feel like. Uh, but okay, yeah. The Mind Tyrant would be a great choice here to deal with the uh, Magnetars for sure. Uh, remember that this version of the game uh, still has the old idea of the Mind Tyrant, where it just steals the unit after a spell cast. A slow moving projectile, so that's awkward. Uh, but um, even the new version would be really good in this situation because it, it just casts onto the unit, it slows them over two seconds, and after two seconds, they're stunned. And as long as you keep the Mind Tyrant alive, uh, you can just keep that stun going indefinitely. You just have to keep them in the area. So it's risky, it's got positioning uh, associated with it, but it's absolutely a pretty big deal. So we'll see uh, if that Mind Tyrant can be useful. It's already in production, but Hapsaya wants to attack beforehand just to see if those uh, Phalanxes are indeed still attacking. He's a... Uh... <laughs> oh no, I was wondering what was happening here, but this Phalanx is attacking his own unit. That's very... That was very strange. I thought for a second he was attacking the analog and like I was just missing the, the mortar projectile, but nope. 
All right, so a bit of a mixed army coming down here now instead of just pure zealot. He's going to see if he can slam on top of this six o'clock position, keep his opponent contained down to the five base count. And right now he's kind of getting uh, obfuscated by this treasury, uh, but he should be able to come in here, deny the construction of everything, and indeed throw the zealots on to the friendly fire. But there's a lot of penumbras and a lot of magnetars. And a synthetic cyanide is now on the way, probably for demiurges, if I had to guess. Uh, could also be for the Clarion analog combo, which is very, very good on this version of the game. You know, these units are basically consigned to death, unless uh, say just right-clicks them back to base from this point. Not so sure what he's going to end up doing, but they get, they're get they going to get roped on in by the Magnetars. Very thematic. All right, well, with this Nexus being put down... Hapsaya does have to consider him, you know, concern himself with that position. He's going to go ahead and charge forward. The analogs trying to provide a little bit of power here. Nice split. So he doesn't end up losing any units directly to the Magnetar. I think that the Phalanx Splash could be enough, but it's not actually going to fire off, funnily enough. And look at that. There it goes. The Magnetar is indeed. Uh, it attacked the analog, and the analog pulled it back. It was like, hey, actually, uh, reverse right back at you. And so that ends up working out very, very nicely for Hapsaya. Uh, the analog just returns the, the projectile back at the sender, basically, to, for half damage. But it will still proc on hit. So if it was a Magnetar shot, then the Magnetar is suddenly hitting itself and pulling it towards the analog. Unfortunately, now Hapsaya has overextended a little bit here. There's no hope for him to actually breach this position. So that's a lot of tech units, you know, gas expenditure, etc. that goes down the drain. He's making a Clarion right now. He has a lot of money in the bank. We'll see what more he can do. But shutting down this uh, 9 o'clock position is very important, right? Even though, though Ayud is at Tier 3, it feels like he's, he's holding on. Uh, only just. Now, he does have a, a big stack of Penumbras. They can walk over small units. He has two Magnetars with that attack force, and he's got more stuff coming as well. So, he is still very scary at this point, but honestly, like, Zealot Clarion Analog sounds like a great counter to the Penumbra move. We'll see if that ends up being uh, thrown out there or not. Now, the uh, Magnetars are here to do a little bit of damage to the Engrams before they finish warping in. Uh, these forces over here are just reminding Ayud that he does indeed have stuff over there. Neither player going after the neutral bases. It's kind of interesting. I mean, you could just waypoint workers there and start harvesting. All right, so that structure ends up getting canceled. The attack force is thinking about how it can move forward, but it's kind of catching some of the military over here. And remember, when you throw a lot of zealots at this problem, you absolutely do get the benefit of... Um, dealing with the penumbras uh, by providing them uh, with some friendly fire targets, right? Man, these uh, magnetars are, are just pulling in these high power units. They end up being very powerful. Double Yamato onto that position. That's going to reduce the shields of the Archon very heavily. And you can see here that all those zealots concentrated in one location. The penumbra was able to just walk right over them. So that is awkward. Hapsaya now back against the wall again. Where's that mine tyrant? I don't know where it went. It must have died at some point while I wasn't looking. But that's going to be the game, folks. Who GG's anymore? Certainly not Hapsaya. I mean, we knew that was coming. Uh, and Aud making it to Tier 3 and then deploying that. Uh, the counter wasn't able to be erected in time. There's a couple of ideas there that maybe uh, Protoss would have been able to do. But what makes Cosmonarchy so interesting to me is that you almost never get to that endgame tech. And so, you you know, you really start to experiment. Like, when somebody gets up to endgame tech successfully, as Terran, for example, that should be like a sign where they're like, oh my god, I can't imagine, what should I build? I have no idea. I have to start thinking about this and putting the theory to the test that I've always thought, that, like, maybe I do this and that, and it works. It's just really cool to imagine what the uh, end result will be when people get more drilled on tier three stuff. Not just of what to use and what to build and how to do it, because I think e Aud's choices there were pretty good, but can uh, players respond to it well, right? And so anyway, a lot of the stuff that we saw in that game is still going to be valid even on the current patch, which is nice. You know, you saw the old Uptecton and the old Hierophant, you know, graphically those are obviously less powerful and less lame, uh, or a little bit more lame rather. But uh, besides that, I mean, a lot of what you saw there was indeed applicable. So very interesting game. And uh, again, shout out to Crankadow for reviewing it for me to make sure that it worked all the whole way through. I appreciate having a, a buddy to do that for me. Uh, and shout out to uh, Hapsaya and Ayud for the game. Of course, you can join us and play some Cosmonarchy yourself using our Discord link in the description. Uh, but aside from that, that's going to do it for me. GG.